Good evening, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Hurricane Baptist Church. Uh, we're into the study of the book of Acts, and this will be our 13th lesson. Uh, we're not getting through it very fast. It's, we're only in chapter 4 on this lesson, and we'll be looking at verses 13 to 22. Uh, we know that uh, Peter and John, and well, we go back, go back to the day of Pentecost, we went through that, and we got up to where the disciples are now going out, and Peter and John are in trouble. Uh, they healed a lame man, and... Uh, They've been uh, preaching and uh, about the resurrection. They got in trouble with the Sadducees over the preaching of the resurrection, and, and uh, so they're being persecuted, being persecuted for doing good. And uh, of course, we can reflect back into the Gospels, and we know that's what happened to Jesus. Then uh, uh, Jesus got persecuted for doing good. He never uh, preached about revolution. He never talked about overthrowing the Roman government. He never carried on about any of that. All he did was preach the truth and heal people and uh, do all kind of miracles and preach the kingdom, try to get people into the kingdom. So we see that uh, the disciples are going to go through the same thing, and, and we will too. Uh, we don't know when it's going to start in our country. We're getting a little touch of it here or there, but nothing really drastic like uh, those foreign, especially the foreign nations over in the Middle East or down South America and those places. It's uh, The persecution is really bad. We know that we hear people talking about Christians in, in our nation, and they talk about it in, in a hateful way, but uh, so far uh, there's not been any uh, overt activity against Christianity. But anyway, as we get into our study here, we're into chapter 4 and verse 13, and, and we see that in verse 12, that same chapter, uh, we see that fame, one of the more famous verses of that portion of Scripture. He says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And, and that's, I think that's one of the problems is the, the name of Jesus, as we see all about this portion of Scripture. It's the power of the name of Jesus, the power to change lives, the power to, to move people to do what's right and to uh, put their faith and trust in God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and there's only one name that can do that, as you have to go through the, the blood of Jesus. Uh, to the cross uh, to get to the Father. So we'll go ahead now. We're going to get into verse 13. It says, Now when they, the, the rulers there, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So we see that they... They see the boldness, and they realize that that they've been with Jesus. Because remember how Jesus he he, he wasn't he was meek, uh, but he was not a wimp. Uh, he was willing to stand up and and to speak against the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And if you remember over in uh, what's in Matthew chapter 23, I think it is, he says, "Woe unto you! Woe unto you! Woe unto you!" He's bringing judgment on their hypocrites. He calls them and and all that they tried to do to the people. So he was he was meek, uh, but he was not fearful. He was bold in his uh, approach to them. We see over in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 he says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. So when we've been with Jesus we have that, that, that boldness and that word there has the idea of confidence that we can come with confidence into the throne of grace uh, before the Lord. We have that because of our relationship with God through his Son we can have that confidence knowing that God will hear our prayers and respond to them. And also then when we get into the, the world of witnessing, we can come boldly because we have the truth and we have within us the power of God. We have the word of God so we can go and, and witness. And we see here that they're, they're speaking boldly. These rulers, they're, they're, they can be intimidating. But uh, Peter and John, now they, they're indwelled by the Holy Spirit and they're on fire for the Lord, so they're, they're willing to move and and uh, we see that they're, they're taking the chance. They're putting their neck out on the line here. And they're trusting God to take care of them. And that's the key. You know, a lot of times when we read about missionaries, how their boldness, how they how they handle things when they get caught up in, in some strife within a country that they're in, uh, their boldness to speak up. And uh, sometimes it's not always the good consequences in man's eyes, but God's always in control. And we see here that uh, they're bold in that. And then in verse uh, 14 there in chapter uh, 4, they say, And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. So here they are. They're upset with Peter and John. They, they've healed this man. and, and uh, But he's, he's standing right there. Uh, he's, he's right there with them. So the idea is that they can't denounce it. 
And this isn't one of those, just a profession, you know. Hey, uh, Peter and John said, hey, uh, last week we was over here at the temple and we, we healed this guy and he could get up and he could walk. He hadn't been able to walk since birth and, and we healed him. No, they were, it wasn't a story that they just told. There, here was an actual event. Here was the evidence of that miracle worked. And uh, so they, they, they don't want to acknowledge it. They, they want to try to deny it, but they can't because here's the proof. And sometimes, you know, we get caught like that. People can get caught up and uh, you, you want something to be true and you, you don't want the other to be true, but you can't deny it because it's standing right in front of the, the proof, the evidence is right there. So we can understand the idea of what they want to do. They, they uh, moved Peter and John away from him in verse 15. When, when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they said, hey, we want out to move over here, go in the other room. They confirm, conferred among themselves that they got to make a decision. Okay, they don't want Peter and John there to be part of this. They got to make a decision. What are they going to do? What can we do with them? So we're going to have to make a decision. Verse 16 says, saying, What shall we do to these men? What, what can we do? For indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. It's manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. He said, This, this miracle has been done. He said, And I. Uh, He's been made whole. Uh, everybody knew it. All the people knew it. They couldn't deny it. He said, you know, the, the power of Christ. Uh, they, Peter said, we healed him in the, in the name of Jesus. That's the power of Christ. That's how he's been healed. And these, these Sadducees, uh, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the teaching of what Peter and John's doing. And, and they, they, they have to try to do something to discredit them. Uh, they have to try to do something that's going to uh, turn the people away from it, but they can't. Because the evidence of, of a changed man is right in front of them. This, this lame man who got brought in and was set by the gate beautiful, you know, every day, and then he be uh, begged for alms, and uh, he's standing there now. He's not a, a lame man anymore. He's a healed man. And you know, when, you, when I read that and just uh, thinking about it, um, wouldn't it be great if people could look at our lives and uh, especially those that knew us before, and say, wow, look at the difference. I can see the change it made in his life or her life. That the, that the evidence would be so, it wouldn't be something, well, you know, did they get saved, didn't they get saved, or are they Christian, or are they not a Christian? Look at their life. And I know that there's just to see somebody's life and what they say and how they act isn't always a the foolproof test, but it's sure a good indication. You know, it's a sure good indication if you if you were one way and you changed. For those of us that got saved later in life, you know, I like 45 years old and I got saved. And, and so there was a big change. People could see the change. And those that I run into now after being away for all these years and go back and run into some of them, I think, they, wow, there is a change from what you used to be, how you used to be. So and we want to we want to have that testimony so people can look at us and see the power of Christ. And that's what this is all about. Peter and John, they're, they're standing there in the power of Christ. They're, they're preaching and they're teaching in the power of Christ. They, they've healed this man in the power of Christ. And they're willing to face whatever is going to come down the pipe in the power of Christ. And so as Christians, we want to be that, that witness. We want to be there so people can see that, that transformed life. And they, they can't deny it. And that's why, that's why our testimony is so important. When we proclaim the name of Jesus as our Savior, when we're out there and we're, we're trying to live the kind of life we should, and we're not going to be sinless, so we need to strive, though, to know that people are going to look at us. So we strive to sin less. We strive to be obedient. We see Peter and John here, they're out there, they're, they're, going, to be, they're going to suffer for what they're doing. We know that as we read Scripture, Christians over in foreign lands, they suffer I just uh, read here the other day where they kidnapped 11 Christians over there and uh, someplace, I think Sudan or someplace down there, and they kidnapped 11 men and they took five of them out and made them kneel and shot them and killed them. And they, what they, as they, before they killed them, each man gave their name and professed their faith in Christ. I am so-and-so and I am a Christian. And then they killed them. So the boldness that we're going to have to have someday down the line is we need to be ready for that. And these men, when the power of God within them, in the name of Jesus, they're out there going to do the work they're called to do. So let's go a little bit further in verse 17. They said, okay, so we know we can't deny it in verse 16. So what are we going to do? But, but that is spread no further among the people. In other words, we don't want to go any farther than this. If we can just contain the damage, 
All right, if we can just, just keep it amongst ourselves or just keep it amongst these people, let us straightly threaten them. And here's, here's the threat, that, that, that they speak henceforth to no man in his name. In other words, don't preach Christ anymore. Yeah, you can go out and get around, but don't talk about Jesus. See, that's, that's the, when we look at the world and we look at all the, the persecution of Christians, that's the hang-up. It's Jesus. He's the problem. He's the one that changes lives. And, that's, and Christians don't preach revolution. They don't preach lawlessness. They don't preach violence. They preach love and peace. They try to demonstrate the love and peace. So why does the world hate him so much? J-E-S-U-S. -S, Jesus. It's that name. The devil can't stand that name. And so the world, under the control of the devil, they're out to destroy the Christian. They want to destroy the Christians. And that's why we're going to see more and more persecution someday in our country. But they want to threaten them. He says that, that you don't do it anymore. Okay, this is what they're going to do. This is, this is their game plan. So they're, remember, they set them off to the side. So they called them. And here's what they told him. Now he said, and he commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. In other words, here's what it is. You, you don't speak, you don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And so Peter and John said, oh, if that's all there is to it, okay, we won't do that. No, they did, did they? Uh, the, the idea, and keep in mind something we don't normally uh, comprehend or understand from this, but these men, they were the rulers. They had the right to make the laws. Now, they couldn't kill anybody. We remember back in Jesus' trial, they had to take him to Pilate, to the Romans, so that he have him executed. They couldn't execute him. But when these men told them not to do that, not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus, if they went ahead and did that, they were responsible for breaking the laws. And they would have to suffer the consequences. And we don't know what kind of consequences all they could have brought upon them. We know there could have been beatings. Uh, that was one of the big things that they did back in that day and time. Whip them, could have put them in jail, locked them up, all those things. But the idea is that there could be consequences to their threatenings. Over in uh, Philippians uh, one twenty eight, it says this, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. So don't, don't be worried about those that want to persecute you, your adversaries. Don't worry about that. He says over in Philippians uh, one twenty-eight. there. He says, uh, because which to them is an evident token of perdition, but unto you, salvation. It's an evidence of your salvation. It's one of those things that we go through because that we're saved. So we see this is, their, this is what they're told to do. So now, now they have to do something, don't they? It's just like you and I. When the laws come out, when they at this day and time as we go through this with the, the pandemic and all these things going on and we're told to, to wear a mask, we're told to stay six feet apart and do all these things. So uh, we have to decide are we going to do it or not? Are we going to obey these? Uh, these aren't really law, put down as laws so much right now, I don't believe, but because uh, they're not really enforcing it. But people have to make a decision. Are you going to obey or not obey? Uh, wearing your seatbelts, I know back when that first came out, people had a lot of problems with that. They obey that law. They have to make a decision. So if you make a decision not to do it, then you have to be willing to face the consequences. And see, what we're talking about here, they've been told not to do it. So now Peter and John have to make a decision. And they know that if they decide to keep on preaching and teaching Jesus, then there could be consequences. Well, there will be consequences. And that's the same for you and I, that as in our walk with the Lord, as people start confronting us and, and pushing back against us, we need to understand if the laws come out against the church, against the Bible, then we have to make a decision. And that's what we're going to be just like Peter and John here. He said that in verse 18, he commanded not to speak anymore or teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19 says, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, Judge ye. He said, Well, it be right, more right to, to listen to you or to listen to God. What should I do? What is more important? So we know that in, as a Christian, God's law comes before man's law. Right? God's law is always the, the predominant, the, the preeminent law. It's the one that, that ranks at the top. We obey God's law first. We obey men's law as long as they don't violate God's law. Paying your taxes. You might not agree with the taxes, but we're called to pay them anyway. You may not agree with wearing your seatbelt, but we're called upon to do it anyway. We're to obey man's law as long as they don't violate God's law. Now, when they tell us we can't worship, you can't go to church and worship, you can't preach and teach the Bible, you're limited in what you say. That's a different story. 
And that's what Peter and John are facing right here. So he said, what? Yeah, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge. God is the, the supreme authority. His law comes first. It's just like in our, in our nation. Uh, if you go through the court system, you go through the local court, and maybe you have a problem there with something, so then it, it doesn't come out the way you want it to, so then you go to the appellate court, and we go to different courts till you get to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has the final say. And that's what it is. All these uh, things, if we look at God, God has the final say. In fact, he's, he's higher than our Supreme Court, isn't he? But, so God is the ultimate authority. So when we are faced with a decision on what to do and what not to do, I take what man says and I take what God says. And I know that God is the dominant authority. So that's where I go as a Christian. But I have to realize, listen, I have to realize that being obedient to God does not eliminate consequences for breaking man's law. And that's where sometimes where we get confused. We think, well, if I do what God tells me to do, then I won't have any problems. Then he'll take care of it. Well, he takes care of it, but in his own way. A good example, and we'll see a little bit later, with Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. But we, as we look at this right now, he says, you decide what's right. But in verse 20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have, listen, we have seen and heard. He said, we, we've got to proclaim, we've got to tell everybody what we have seen and what we've heard. They, they walked with Christ. They saw him after the resurrection. They heard his commandments. And he gave them some commandments. He said, this is what he told them in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we see that he's, they're commanded to go. Go. He says in the first part, he says, when we teach all nations, that's to share the gospel and make disciples, bring them to Christ. And the second time he talks about teaching in verse 20, he says, teach them to observe or disciple them. That's what they're called to do. In uh, John 20, 21, then Jesus said to them, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so I send you. So we see the idea that they're being sent to the, to the world. They're being sent. God the Father sent him and he's sending them into the world. He said, we cannot, but we have to speak of the things that we have seen and heard. We saw the resurrection. We saw what he was. We saw what he did. And we want to know that how many Christians in the world today are sharing the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we, 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 can't, we haven't seen the physical Jesus. We haven't seen those physical miracles that he did. We've, we've only heard through Scripture. But we know that there's been a change. We know what He's done for us, what He's done in us, and we see His hand at work. And so there's, there's the call to witness, to tell others what He's done. And that's what John is saying here. He says, and Peter, we cannot but speak. We've got to say what we've seen and heard. We can't keep it inside. We've got to be a witness for Jesus. A little bit further there, we see that in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest or revealed unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. This is what he's talking about there. He says that, that know the terror, know that what we want to do, we have that responsibility to go tell men about the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constraineth us. That's in verse 14 there. He says, because we judge, that's judge that if one died for all, then all were dead. And that's the situation of the world. Listen, there's a lot of dead men walking out there. There's a lot of people out there that are dead in their trespasses and sins and walking around like there's nothing wrong. So keep in mind, is we have that responsibility then to go tell them about what's going on. Tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Listen, that hope, that's a confidence. How can you be so confident? How can you be so sure that you're going to go to heaven? How can you be so sure that you're born again? You need to be ready to give that reason and do it with meekness and fear. We don't, we don't push it. We don't overwhelm or we don't overrun people. We just take and tell them the truth. Why do I have so much confidence? Why do I have so much... Uh, Hope, as they say here, that use that word, that confidence, is because I know God. 
I know I have done what God told me to do. I have given my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have had him come in my heart and save me. I'm indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And God has promised me, if I did that, I have eternal life. And I can never be separated from him. So that's my, my assurance. I know. So I need to be ready to share that. Be able to answer every man to ask you, why are you so confident? Because I know that I know that I know. I know what I was. I know what happened. And I know what I am. Go a little bit further, then he says, and so then, so when they had further threatened them, they let him go, finding nothing how they might punish him, because the people, because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. And that's, that's the key. The key right there to all of this is that God gets the glory. And I would ask you, in your life, does God get the glory from your life? See, Peter and John, when they were confronted with, how did you do this? How did you heal a man? They didn't say, oh, look at us. No, they said, look at him. We did it in the name of Jesus. God got the glory. And that's what we need to be sure. So many times uh, people, you do something for someone and to the church or as an individual, as a Christian, and people thank you, and that's great. But they need to remember that it's God that did it. Uh, God is the one that provides uh, the, the food, that provides the people. You know, I like it. I got I to... What I was thinking about this, I got this screwdriver. I don't know if you see it or not. This this screwdriver, and you know, it's got that Phillips head on it, and you can do a lot of good work with this. But you know what? If I just lay that screwdriver down on my table here on my desk and leave that lay, that screwdriver has no value. It only has value when someone takes it and someone uses it. And that's the way it's you and I. We just sitting there, we have no value. But when God takes us and He uses us, we have value. Then he can work through us. He can get the work done. We are the tools. We're his toolbox. Christians are the toolbox of God. And he uses us to reach out to this world. He, reach, he uses us to, to help bring people to Jesus. He uses us to help bring glory to him. So when we don't allow him to use us, then we don't have much value. Not in the kingdom. We don't, you're not saved to sit on a pew someplace. You're, you're saved to bring light to the gospel, to bring light to the Lord Jesus Christ. Over, there's a couple of verses over here in, in Matthew 5, 16. He says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, when we, people appreciate us, but they, they're so thankful, but they forget to thank God. Over in James chapter 1, verse 17, he says this, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The good gifts come from God. He, we are privileged sometimes, we're honored sometimes to be able to be used by Him, to reach out to people. But we're being used by Him, so to Him. When people want to thank you and appreciate you, but be sure you point to Him. Say, praise God. He gave me the health to do this. He provided the food for me to bring to you. He gave me the vehicle to even bring it in. See, it's all Him. It's all the tools that he uses to accomplish his will in people's lives. And it's our responsibility to be used. We have the call. We have the responsibility to allow him to use us. As Jesus said in John 15, 5, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Listen to this. But without me, you can do nothing. We're nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ. We are nothing without the power of the Holy Spirit that's within us. We can do nothing of our own. We can only do what He empowers us to do, what He calls us to do, and then we need to be responsive. He doesn't make you. How many times have you felt the need to say something to someone or do something for someone and said, oh, maybe that's just me. Uh, maybe that's not God. Listen, if you had the desire to do that as a Christian and it was good for someone, you would be moved by God to do it. We, we sometimes try to find excuses if it's going to make us uncomfortable. You know, as Christians, we get, some, we get the idea that everything should be easy. Well, it's not always easy. Peter and John faced it. He's willing to take a chance, and they're not going to stop preaching, and they're under the threat of the judgment of these rulers. They're going to be, they have to be willing to face the consequences. And I would ask you, are you willing to face the consequences of standing for God? Taking a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ when the when the society starts turning against us, when the world starts turning against us and speaks against us, are you willing to take a stand and face the consequences? These people in foreign lands, they face it all the time. 
people come to know Christ in the Muslim nations and they know their family's going to kick them out, uh, they're going to be beaten, they could be kidnapped, all, anything, even up to death. But they do it anyway because it's worth it. So if you're watching and you're not a Christian, listen, if you just happen to be watching this and you're not a Christian or maybe you go to church and you never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this is the time. This is the time you need to turn. Turn from the world. We call that repent. Turn from your sin. Repent and turn and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put, believing that shed blood paid the price for your sins. Put your faith and trust in God's word that God has promised you eternal life through his son. You need to do that today. We don't know what's going to happen as we see the, the election and all that's going on in our nation today. We have no idea what's down the road. But I know one thing for sure. God's in control. And I can trust Him. And you can too. If you don't know Christ, trust Him today. Put your faith and trust in that shed blood that was paid for, your, for the remission of your sins. And for you as a Christian, look at these people. Look at their example. And put your trust, trust and faith in Christ to walk the path he's called you to walk. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the day and for this time, Lord. And we just pray you be with each one of us as we walk this pathway of life. As your children, help us to have a desire to be obedient to you and to take a stand. Let people see Christ in us. And for those that don't know Christ, we pray that they would open, have their eyes open, that the glorious light of the gospel would shine through, that some Christian would take the gospel to them. They would hear the truth, repent, and put their faith and trust in Jesus. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're going to do. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.